Every 15 minutes, one person dies in a texting and driving accident. That's 96 people in one day. Here's what that looks like. I need your help here, seniors. Please stand up. If you're a senior, stand up. Now look around you. 672 people die per week in a texting and driving accident. This is equivalent to me's high school visit. Losing our entire senior class in just one week. Thank you, seniors. You may now be seated. And if you had a white cross, you may now take a seat as well. Place your cross in the box. December the 4th of 2009, he looked down for five seconds to read a text message. And now, please give his mother and him your absolute 
I mean, just pay attention to everything they have to say and think about what they're talking about because this can happen to any of us in this room. And it's so important to listen to their message and get home and talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, talk to everyone you know about talking on the phone and texting while you're driving and tell them you don't want them doing it because you want them to be around because you love them and, and you want them to be whole. Come on out here, Julie and Austin. So I am Austin's voice, and he wants you to know, yeah. no text is worth the risk. Take the don't text and drive pledge at davis and please ask others to do the same. That is what was shown in June and July of um, this last year of 2013. And um, it was happenstance that I had gone out to Davis Moore to have my oil changed. and. Dawson was walking through and um, I had nerves and I finally got up and I said, Dawson, I need to, I, I would really like to talk to you and tell you how much I really appreciate what you do on your commercials and the message that you speak about on all different levels to our community. And I said, I want you to meet my son, Austin. And I said, he is a victim of texting and driving, but he survived. And it took off from there. Dawson gave us an opportunity to shoot a commercial with him. And as I said, it ran through Jan June and July of 2013. Since then, we have been at to continue to speak at different levels of high schools. We have been asked to speak at rec centers. We have um, actually even spoken at an elderly home um, because the elderly are so concerned about their grandchildren and what is happening on our roads today. I am going to start our PowerPoint and tell you just a little bit about Austin. And if you watch the screen, this is my son and his really true personality. Before Austin, and he laughs. Um, he loves his picture. Austin was a kidder and is still a kidder. He loves to pull pranks. By the way, my husband is here. Larry, where'd you go? Um, you should be in my house. Between my husband and between my son. Um, you know, there's just days I just want to walk out. Because they are always pulling pranks. But I have to say, at least I have my son. So that they can do that. With Austin's personality, Austin was fun-loving. Austin would do anything for anybody. He wasn't the best student, but you know, he knew how to 
Nagel, his teachers here at Mays, you know, middle of the semester report cards would come out and Austin would have a D and say, Austin, something's got to give here. Oh yeah, he'd come out, report cards would come out, all stink. He'd pull an A. With that, we move on to Austin's career in soccer. Both Austin and his sister Brooke, which was a graduate of 06 of Mays, um, he uh, both started at AYSO at age four. Continued to move on to continue to play club and eventually end up here at Mays High School. Both Brooke and he played both junior varsity and varsity sports under Mike Dara, who has turned out to be a great friend and colleague. Um, through that, um, through the years of soccer, we traveled club. In our home, um, it was very clear very early, you play club soccer, you will get a scholarship. The amount of money that we spent traveling through 12 years of high school and junior high and elementary school to take our kids to different states to play club soccer got very expensive. They weren't real keen on our ruling, but it was one way for them to pay back what we had put out and what we had put forth towards their academic and athletic schooling. I'm very happy to say that both Brooke and Austin went on to French University. They both did receive an academic and an athletic scholarship. These are some pictures of Austin playing here at Banks. He was very physical. He loved the sport. He played back defender and was pulled forward when he needed that when they needed an attacker. He has long legs, long stride, and could pretty much outrun anybody. Something else that we did as a family. This is just a little background of what our family did. It was very important for us as a family to have the kids see the world. This is a picture of Austin at St. Martin scuba diving. We had taken a cruise the summer before his accident. Um, our kids, yeah, in some ways, were quite spoiled when it came to vacations. Um, Larry, my husband, has a job that let him travel the United States, and there was so much that he wanted to teach the kids. So we, co we continued that tradition every summer. We let one of the kids pick where they wanted to go. This this time of the scuba diving Caribbean cruise that we went on, Austin chose to go on. So this was his choice. Austin was an avid boarder. Skateboard, longboard, wakeboard, snowboard, anything with a board, Austin could do it, and he was very good at it. Unfortunately, at this point in time, boarding may never be in his life again. We had actually gone to the neurosurgeon that did Austin's surgery, and um, we asked him if it would be possible for him to go back and snowboard. Our neurosurgeon's words to us were, you take him snowboarding and he falls once, he will undo everything he has done. 
it will take him back to infancy. So his dream of being able to snowboard may never be a reality to him again. This was him, this was true happiness to Austin. Austin's dream was to live in the mountains and to be able to ski every day. He wanted to go to Boulder. Then he wanted to go KU. And when he figured out that we were quite serious about the scholarships, he chose friends. Because <laughs> he knew that mom and dad would be close and if he needed anything, he just called dad. Dad was a sucker. Dad let him have whatever he wanted. Okay. When Austin got to French University, he had a roommate. That roommate is James. James was from London. James was short and a spitball of fire. He was so fun. The summer before Austin's accident, Austin got to go back to London with James. He spent two months, two weeks, excuse me, two weeks in London. My son is the only one in our family that has been overseas. My husband and I have never been overseas, nor has my daughter. And that was the summer before accident. French University came into the picture after he graduated. As you know, he received both academic and athletic. So did his sister. Brooke and Austin were inseparable. His sister. Brooke is two years older than Austin. Their birth dates are March 22nd and March 29th. They exactly two years minus one week apart. If you saw Brooke, you would see Austin. If you saw Austin, you would see Brooke. With Friends University, the men's and women's team would travel together as a soccer team. So my son and my daughter traveled everywhere for the first two years that my son and daughter were at Friends. Okay. This is Austin's first truck. And I bring this up because um, as they were in high school, we supplied my husband and I the vehicle that though they drove. But there were stipulations, and in fact, there were even contracts. My husband drew up contracts for each of my children to sign. And there was repercussions if they did not follow those contracts. Those contracts in them were no extra passengers if you were under the age of 18. You could not have alcohol in your vehicle. You could not get a speeding ticket. And if you did, you paid it out of his own pocket. The reason why this truck is so important is because this truck bought himself. So that contract become null and void. That meant my son texted. That meant my son had extra people in his vehicle, probably shouldn't have been in his vehicle at times. With that came his accident. Okay. 
on December 4th, 2009. We received a phone call at 3 a.m. in the morning, my husband and I did, and, and the phone was on my side of the bed. And at the time, um, my father-in-law was in a nursing facility and wasn't doing real well, and, and I just figured, you know, it, it, something had happened to Lou, and uh, so I picked up the phone and said hello, and all I heard on the other end is, is could I possibly speak to Mr. Breitenstein? Sure. Hand the phone to my husband. And I can hear this man's voice. And the first thing he says is, Sir, are you the father to Austin Breitenstein? At that moment, I, re I remember vividly I took the covers and just laid them back, got out of bed, walked into my closet, no, knowing really truly what I was doing. I just knew I needed to get dressed. I had no idea where I was going. In the background, I could hear my husband say, yes, sir. Okay, sir. I understand. Where do we need to go? We will, we are on our way. The phone is thrown across the room, and all I remember is saying, where do we need to go? He's either in jail or he's in the hospital. With a tear in my husband's eye, he says, we need to go to St. Francis Hospital. Austin has been in an accident. We get to St. Francis Hospital and we are met by a chaplain. That chaplain would not tell us anything. We sat in the ER for an hour and 15 minutes not knowing if my child was alive. Eventually, the doctor came down and got us with the chaplain and they took us up to the third floor of St. Francis Hospital ICU. Not just ICU, but traumatic, surgical, intensive care unit. We were put in a very small room and it was dark. It was small. And actually, another doctor comes in and she says, um, Mr. and Mrs. Brightenstein, I'm sorry to tell you that your son has been in a very serious accident. And quite honestly, we do not know if he's going to survive. At that moment, all I could think of in my brain was, get me to him. Quit wasting my time and get me to my son. I want my son. This is what I walked in on. This is what my husband and I walked in on. Your heart is ripped from your chest. We had a nurse um, that, in fact, we stay in touch with that was assigned Nelson's case. Was the most outstanding nurse that we could have had that first day.
by 6.30, Facebook had blown up. And I'm talking 6.30 a.m. We had kids lined the halls of St. Francis I see the third floor. That eventually security had to come and corral the kids and put them into different waiting rooms. Mrs. B, is Austin going to make it back? Is he going to be back at school by semester? Mrs. B, you know, we don't understand. Help us to understand what can we do. We wait, kids. We wait. Austin's brain has swelled. You see, that night, he had gone out with some friends, and um, had had a little bit of a argument with a friend, a girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, and they were going back and forth on their phones, text messaging. Austin felt so bad that um, someone brought him back across town, and we still do not know who brought Austin across town. No one has stepped forward. We do know that he called his sister, Brooke. Brooke says, Austin, wherever you need to go, I will come get you. I promise I will come get you. Just settle down. I'll come get you. He didn't listen. He got in his truck and he went to try to find this girl to apologize. Once she knew that he was at her home, she refused to meet him. He got angry. He got in his truck and he did not buckle and he sped. He got onto 235 Zoo Boulevard. And the mile marker is 8 slash 2, just past Central. We drive that every day. We drive past that mile marker every day to his therapies. With Austin not being buckled, when he veered off the highway, he overcorrected, which shot his body to the middle of his truck. The mile marker that he hit is right here, and the pole. When he hit that, he was ejected head first through the windshield and landed on the back of his head. He cracked the back of his skull. What we found out later was that there were four girls that came came upon his accident and they stopped. We do know of one young lady that went to Derby High School. We tried to contact her and tell her how much we appreciated that she sat on the highway with my son and held him She wished to stay anonymous. We don't know who she is, but she stayed with him until paramedics got there. We were very lucky. There was an actual four minute time span from the time of his last text that 911 was called. The reason why I know that is because I got his phone. Our first day in T-S-I-C-U, 
our insurance agent came to me and my husband and this says, I've got to go to accident site and make up a report and I need to go look in Austin's truck. And I said, Wes, you get me his phone. I want his phone. Luckily, the phone was still in his truck. That phone told me the story of what had happened that night. That is why I know the last text that he read was at 1.52 a.m. and 911 was called at 1.56 a.m. six days in SICU. Austin was put on a ventilator, was comatose for the first few days, and then he was put into a medically induced coma. The only way that I can explain a medically induced coma would be like a file cabinet. There is so much swelling to the brain that they have to shut down all activity in the brain because every noise that drops, he hears a voice, a beep. Your brain tries to find it in that file cabinet and he tr it tries to place where he's heard it before. But his brain had sustained so much damage that they had to shut that mechanism off. So they induced him into a medicated induced coma. After about day five, we were approached by the neurosurgeon and he finally came to us and says, we cannot stop the swelling. We are going to have to do surgery. Okay, surgery, because you don't understand. This is what they call a craniectomy. We're going to start with a single craniectomy, and if we have to, we will do a bilateral craniectomy. That is when they go in and they literally saw the bone to allow and take that bone piece away so that his brain can swell without outside the limits. We were in the waiting room and my husband got the call. And Larry came back to me and said, Dr. Dickerson says he won't survive unless he takes the other side. actually truly living day by day and my daughter came to us and you know she says mom dad it's gonna be okay we are a family of four and we were meant to be a family of four and we will always be a family of four and we're not gonna lose him little did I know how smart my 21 year old I hung to those words. Today we stand still a family of four. Okay. After we 
left SICU St. Francis, we were airlifted by Eagle Med to a rehabilitation hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska, where Austin began rehabilitation. This is my boy. At this point in time, my son had no function whatsoever. He was not home. He had no faculties. He needed help in all areas. He was an infant. Boys, I'm going to ask you a question and I really want you to think about this because this is what I had to do to my son. Because of texting, I had to help toilet my son. I want you to picture that in your head. Your mom helping you use the restroom. I did things to my son that I never thought I would have to do at age 19. Girls. I will ask you the same thing. You're a young woman. Same question. Think about what your mother would have to help you do. There are now male nurses, ladies. You are on, you're an you are an exhibition for all to see. There's no privacy. When we were in Lincoln, Austin began to um, learn to do a few things. He had to learn to eat. He had to relearn to eat. He had to relearn to swallow. He didn't even know how to swallow. He was fed through a G-tube. And they fed him this brown, yucky stuff. We were actually at Madonna for three and a half months. And through that three and a half months, I never left him. I never came home, which left my husband and my daughter back in Wichita. I left my daughter. That May, my daughter graduated from French University with her bachelor's degree and I was not there for her last semester. I had to make a choice between my kids. My son was 170 pounds. He got down to 126 pounds. So much so that it was at a point of a critical stage where he could have passed at this point. But we got him back. And he started gaining weight. And he started doing things that I didn't think that was possible. He started to walk. These 
and we'll play this at the very end. But these, this picture of his is of his very first steps out of a wheelchair. I didn't think it would ever happen, but it did. This picture, and it is also a video that we will play at the very end, shows Austin, I am actually tickling his left side. Excuse me, right side. Left side, left side, because he had the sensation. Because left, Austin's injury was left brain, the right side, he has feeling, if you know what science, left brain, right side, right brain, left side. This was the first time that I got my son to laugh. <coughs> and I got to see his dimples. After spending three and a half months in Lincoln, Nebraska. We had to come back to Wichita for five days and have the neurosurgeon replace Austin's bone. And with that bone, it's not his real bone. They used a plastic composite because the bone had been gone too long and the bone would not have survived. So my, my son has two plastic plates that helps keep his brain from being injured. We spent five days here in Wichita at the Spine Hospital, and then we got right back in the car and we drove to Omaha, Nebraska, which was the second leg of our journey um, to quality living, where we spent another six and a half months on his rehabilitation. By this time, as you can see, my son is making a great comeback. He's lifting weights. He's working on strength conditioning. Okay. He picked up his skill of soccer again. When we got back to Wichita, I reached out to several people. I reached out to Nathan Mulkey at French University, who was Austin's coach. And I said, I need him back out on the soccer field as soon as possible. Nathan says, bring him. Bring him. Which led to Austin being able to go and work out with the wings. Well, at that point in time, Austin got to play with Kevin Tonight, Alex Mosley, Daniel Sack, Brent Hobson, a lot of Mays kids. And they took him in and they treated him just like somebody else. Not somebody with a disability, but with just somebody that was normal. This last summer, Austin was quite the golfer. Austin could outdrive his dad. We started on that golf game. This is Austin Putty at Shangri La. One of our first of our very few vacations since his accident. We were able to take about four days and Larry and Austin and I drove to Shangri-La. Okay. This is my daughter, Brooke, and she's a Chargers fan. There was a gentleman earlier when we were walking through the halls and he had a Chargers shirt on and I said, yeah. It's because my daughter is a Chargers fan and every year we go to the Chief Chargers game. It's mandatory. We got to go. We got to go to the Chiefs Chargers game. 
and my son walked from the parking lot all the way into the stadium and participated just like everyone else in the crowd. You see, since December 4th of 09, my son has gone from infancy to age 23. Some days he's 23, some days he's 15. Some days he can be 10. But more the latter, every day that Austin gets up, he gets up with a smile on his face and he does not give me one problem. He won't come out with me. I know he's not. <laughs> he won't come out with me. This is my son, and I want you to meet the new Breitenstein, Austin. The point of this message, everyone, is that the choice is yours. Dawson is right. We have an epidemic on our hands. I want everyone in this auditorium to, including faculty, I want everyone in this auditorium to help me with something. I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to raise your hand if you ride in a vehicle where your parent texts and drives. My next question is, does that give you the right to text and drive? Because my mom and dad text and drive. They are supposed to be setting an example. It is for you today to go home to your parents today and tell them this story and tell them that you want to live. They may have brought you into this world, but they do not have the choice to take you out. It is not their right. Dawson is right. We're gonna to have to go into the elementary schools and we're gonna to have to start early with these kids, just like the seatbelt laws to get this stopped. Because if we don't, those numbers, one in 15 minutes is going to get one 14 minutes, one in 13 minutes, one in 12 minutes, one in 11 minutes. Now, I've asked Dawson to speak just a little bit about the technology in our vehicles. And I've asked him to say a few words on behalf of the automotive industry. But what I want you to understand and what I need you to understand is that this choice is your choice to not text and drive, no matter what kind of technology you have in your vehicle. You must get your parents to listen to you. You, yourselves, as seniors that will be going on to college, don't let your parents get this phone call, please. You have to make this choice. You are responsible for your own actions. I'm gonna pass it over to Dawson for just a couple of seconds.
sure hope that made an impact on all of you. Uh, I've, I've heard the story several times. We've done a lot of speaking engagements, and it, every time I hear it, it's, oh, it just sends shivers up my spine. Today's cars, the technology in today's cars. Uh, Chevrolet has my link. Chrysler has a big screen that you can do all kinds of stuff on. A lot of it you can do while you're driving the car. Here's what I recommend. If your folks have a car, a new car, a late model car that has that technology in the dash, the navigation, whatever it might be, set it up just like you, back in the day we used to say when you get in your car, set your mirrors, set your rear view mirror, set your seat, set your apps and stuff on your, on your car, so not messing with them while you're driving your car, because they can be as dangerous as talking on the phone and on the phone while you're driving that car because you're taking your eyes off the road you're looking down at that dash and you don't realize how far you're traveling while you're doing that so that would be something that I would highly recommend you do and talk to your folks about doing uh, I want to thank Mays High School SAD for having us here today and I want to thank them for being proactive about this issue of texting and driving and it's not just texting and driving it's paying attention to what you're doing when you're in that car and driving that car. Because one of the things, you know, when you're in sports and you strike out or you miss a basket or whatever you're doing, you can do it over again. You can get better at it. When you make a mistake in a car, it can cost you your life or it can cost you the, the way that you live your life. Austin comes out here and he comes out here because he wants all of you to see what can happen to you and how far he's come since his accident and he's got a long way to go but it's not worth the risk when you're driving a car you have a responsibility to pay attention to what you're doing and that goes for if you're riding in a car you have a responsibility to tell whoever's driving that car, hey, pay attention. I want to get where we're going safe. I want to be safe and I want to be sound when I get there. I want to encourage everyone in this room to take the pledge not to text and drive. That's faculty, that's students. Take, it. take one home and have your parents sign it. I guarantee you there's people in this room, there's teenagers in this room that have been scared to death riding with somebody in your family in a car that's messing with a phone or doing something they ought not to be doing while they're driving. Say something to them about it. It can make the difference between life and death. And I really appreciate all of you being here today to listen to Julie and Austin's message. Thank you very much.
to the biggest high school in Oahu. It is the James Brown High School. So this sign will be setting in the parking lot of Oahu, Hawaii. I don't care how I gotta get there, but it's going. So I am very excited to pass this on to another school from our school, Mays, our alma mater, Austin School. And we hope that you continue to support what Austin and I continue to do. And that is, please, stop and think it can wait, okay? Your message is not that critical to where you have to get that message across now. It can wait, okay guys? Thank you, we are very, very honored. Thank Julian Austin Brenstein for sharing their story with us today. A special sign thanks goes out to myparkingsign.com for, for donating these signs to us. Please thank Dawson Grimsley, President of Davis Moore, Midwest Single Source, and David Kaufman's Allstate Insurance Company, whose don donations made it possible to bring this awareness to Mays High School. If you are willing to commit to not text and drive, please sign a pledge card just outside the gym doors as you exit. Those who do so will be entered in a drawing to win a one-hour limo service provided by Scott at All World DJ. We want to strongly encourage everyone to download the free No Texting and Driving app to your phones today. Save your life, your family's lives, and the lives of those around you by choosing to not text and drive. Please give a round of applause to Dawson Grimsley and Austin. 